Hey there, Internet. Ryan here to tell you that in our age of 2019, nobody buys war bonds anymore. Why would you support the government's unjust actions in foreign lands to secure resources that don't even belong to us? Why would you feed the beast that allows Ares to control us all? Why not go to patreon.com slash evacstation instead? For less than the cost of the countless lives you lost in no man's land, you can help fund our show to enlighten you with discussions of films, games, shows, and other random bullshit. Again, that's patreon.com slash evacstation. Now, the one we've all been waiting for. We couldn't cross the desolate landscape they call No Man's Land, so we set up shop here in this hole in the ground, got our equipment up, and started recording a podcast. Oh, look out! I think I just saw a bullet fly by. We are <laughs> uh, Wonder Waseska, and with me today I have Steve Metters. You know what? I'm a little jealous that I don't get to be Wonder, Wonder Metters, but that's okay. <laughs> you know what? You can be Wonder Metters. We're all Wonder something. It's all right. Steve, Steve was good. Steve, Steve had Steve had a bomb ass character. I, there's no shame, but shout out to God Chris. Damn it, I wonder be wonder. Shout out to Chris Pine. He did a really good job with that role. Like better than I would have oh. thought with that. Yeah, we we're, we're going to talk about Chris Pine. <laughs> we're going to talk about that dude. Uh, before we get too far, I want to shout out to our intro song this week. I haven't done it every episode this season because I've been doing them a lot in like post. And I keep forgetting to like credit them. But this week, I know what I'm going to be doing before I even record this episode. It is The Moment by Miracle Sound featuring Carleen. Uh, it's about the Wonder Woman movie, and it is a fucking great song. Go download all of Miracle, songs, uh, Miracle Sound's music. He is fucking great. Mm, mm, mm. Uh, and of course, if you have time to do that, you can also visit our Patreon page, which we mentioned at the top of the show. You can also visit us on Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, and our lovely email. Ryan, what is that email? That is Diana Prince's the goddess that none of us deserve at gmail. I mean, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. That's evacstation at gmail.com. I like that. I like that. Um, and of course, you can also uh, find us on your pl- pl- podcast platform of choice. Those words are hard to say sometimes. Uh, that includes Peepa, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, and Podcast Addict, among many. Uh, if you like us there, make sure you review us with five stars. It helps uh, our visibility so people can find us and review us, and maybe even get some more subs. That'd be great. Fantastic. Uh, before we get too deep into this week's film, which I'm sure you all know what it is by now, uh, let's talk about our always first segment, What You Watching? Ryan, what do you got for me this week? God. Okay. Uh, so, um, Allegra, uh, whom we've kind of been trading movies back and forth with, uh, about a week or so ago, I had her watch Old Boy, which, if nobody's familiar, is a Korean film that it's really, really peculiar. Uh, it's it's kind of set up like an action yet like thriller that that's just it's very odd. I don't want to spoil anything about it, but it has like a ridiculous ass twist, and it's just it's really good but really weird, like Korean movie cinema. Um, and so I had her watch that, and at the end of it, she said, thank you so much, Ryan, and I said, why? And she said, because you've just given me the green light to show you the weirdest movies that I have encountered oh, in all of Korean cinema. <laughs> and I was like, oh, no. <laughs> Keep in mind, she's lived in Korea, and she oh, she's, she's got a one up on more you. of their nonsense. So she hit me with a movie a couple of days ago. It's called Mobius. Uh, the director is Kim Ki Duk, um, and he is a Korean provocateur uh, that specializes in uh, very, very, very disturbing cinema. Uh, and this this movie 
called Mobius was, of course, no exception. I was, I had no idea what the fuck I was in for, but the entire movie was done pretty much without spoken dialogue. It was all conveyed, like, through acting, um, and it's very kind of gonzo, low budget, but the, uh, like, the gist of it is that um, there, there is a family, uh, a father, a wife, and a son. Uh, the father and the wife are in a very strained relationship, and the wife is actually cheating on... Uh, uh, well, the, the, the father is actually cheating on his wife. And when she finds this out, uh, for, like, without a shadow of a doubt, uh, she assaults his, her husband uh, in the middle of the night by trying to cut his dick off. Ouch. And that, that sounds painful. Unfortunately, she is unsuccessful. Like, like the father stops her from, from doing all that crazy shit. And she's, like, unhinged. So she decides to do the next best thing and successfully cuts her son's dick off. Oh, God. Why? And, and... Then she kind of wanders off in, like, like after eating it, be, like, to make sure that they can't reattach it, she, like, wanders off in the night um, to just kind of lose her mind. And the rest of the movie explores the father and son's relationship, the father who feels responsible for the, the, the horrible things that his son is going through with no dick. Um, and it's just, it's just bad. <laughs> it's just ridiculous. I, 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 I have no idea. I have no idea, but I, I, I gotta say, uh, Allegra, Allegra, I love you. You are expanding Ryan's horizons in ways I never thought he would do. This is, this is fantastic. I love it. Ah, I, she didn't say a word about it. She's just like, we're watching this. And I'm like, okay. And I'm glad she didn't because I absolutely probably would not have watched that. <laughs> Mm. She's, oh she, man, we watched that at like midnight. Oh, that's a terrible time just, to watch that. <laughs> I was I was just gone, and the end of the movie just pissed me off. But it was like it was. It's a very, it's a very provocative and engaging film. And if you're looking to be, if if you're looking to explore some 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 disturbing concepts about you know family relations and shit and and latent sexual frustration go ahead and check this out kim ki duk mobius put out in 2013 that's just for you guys that's just for you listeners see i'm gonna, I'm gonna stick to my uh my true crime podcasts i've been listening to because uh that that's disturbing enough for me and dude there's some fucking weird shit in that oh man i believe it, I believe it. um no so for my what you're watching instead of talking about the podcast i definitely want to talk about those at some point because i found a good one i think you like but uh, i want to talk about a show that actually is going to be getting a season two the week we're recording, and by the time you guys listen to this, I'll probably have already watched that and talk about it in another episode. So, get ready. Uh, Dragon Prince on Ooh, Netflix. Ooh, how is it? How is it? So, so, some preface here. So, this is by one of the head writers of the original Avatar The Last Airbender series. Uh, rumor is he was one of the ones that helmed the best episodes of that series. I am not shocked that that's the case, because this series is pretty solid. Um, so, a few things to note. One, the animation is a little janky at first. It takes a hot minute to get used to, but That's right. but I got used to it pretty quick. I know a lot of people who really couldn't get past it. I don't really know why. I don't think it's that bad, but it takes a hot minute for sure um, for those who were like just jumping in cold. Uh, the premise is basically, you know, elves versus humans, and uh, there's like this, the dragons are basically all but gone for the most part. Except for this one egg that happens to be the, the crux of the whole story. And season two, oh, they, they built up to that so good. Like, I don't want to spoil anything, Ryan, because I think you'll enjoy watching it too much. That I, I, I don't want to do that. But uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I de it's definitely on my list of shit to watch. I just feel like I never get enough time. But yes, no, I definitely want to check that out. Mm -hmm. uh, they do a good job with magic. They do a good job with introducing some cool monsters and creatures. Uh, the the characters. the char Aside from a couple characters I think are kind of dumb, but I'll get into that later. Uh, but, uh, a couple of a lot of the characters in the show feel really layered. They have a lot of motivation behind them, a lot of reason and purpose, and they are, it's a very character-driven show, and I absolutely love that. But like I said, there are two characters, the, uh, son and daughter of the main antagonist. They're kind of dumb, but in a fun, like, Team Rocket kind of way. 
Nice. And I'm like, I can accept this in, in, in the dumbest way possible. I can accept this. <laughs> um, but the heroes are really good. Uh, I love all three of them. They're, they're fantastic. I cannot wait to see if they introduce any more or what. But yeah, I'm, I'm hyped. This is a great show. And if you have not seen it and you have Netflix, please check it out. Uh, because it is definitely worth your time. And season two is coming out this week for us when we're recording. And I'm looking forward to seeing that this weekend. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely going to have to jump on that soon. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, speaking of jumping on things, why don't we jump on to our uh, movie of the week? I am 100% down for that. We resume our crisis in infinite films, uh, already in progress. Uh, and fresh from the frontline trenches, we have Wonder Woman, released in 2017. Directed by Patty Jenkins and written by Alan Heinberg, Zack Snyder, and J- Jason Fuchs? Fuchs? Not sure how you pronounce that. I'm so I'm assuming Fuchs. Fuchs. I'm pretty sure it's Fuchs. I'm yeah. Say if your last name's Fuchs, uh, well, you're gonna have some problems in school, man. I tell you. Uh, <laughs> he gives no fucks. Don't worry about it. A lot of men in that writers' room. There seems a lot, if you ask me. Uh, the film has grossed a worldwide total of eight hundred and twenty-one million seven hundred and sixty-three thousand, over five times what it cost. Mm. Not as high as Aquaman, which I mean, we'll get to that here in a bit. But uh, trust me, it, it's still pretty good. That's still pretty damn good. Uh, and it's all thanks to this amazing cast of people, including uh, Elena, uh, uh, on, uh, not... Uh, Anaya. Anaya, sorry. I'm tr- I was trying to say one thing, I kept thinking the other, and it messed my mouth up. Uh, <laughs> Danny Houston, uh, Saeed... Mm-hmm. I cannot pronounce that last Tag name. Maui. Tag Maui. I didn't research any of these names, I, as you can tell. Uh... <laughs> Ewan Bremer, Eugene Braverock, uh, David Thulis, uh, Robin Wright, Connie Nielsen, Chris Pine, and the one the whole world has been waiting for, Gal Gadot. <sighs> Lord have mercy. This film has boasted a total of 22 awards. That's a lot for the, for the DCEU. This includes the SAG Award for Outstanding Action Performance by a Stunt Ensemble in a Motion Picture. Uh, the Saturn Award to Gal Gadot for Best Actress, AFI's Award for Movie of the Year, Patty Jenkins received an Impact Award for the Chicago Independent Film Critics, the Costume Design Guild Award for Excellence in Sci-Fi and Fantasy Film, the Empire Award for Best Sci-Fi slash Fantasy, and several Teen Choice Awards, proving the CEOs that uh, teen boys aren't all the only ones wanting bloody, gory, uh, man-on-man action. But let's get to some fun facts. Yes, the facts are indeed fun over here. Now, part of which is, while Gal Gadot was a part of the reshoots for the movie, including stunts, she w- like she had to do some of those while being five months pregnant. She was visibly pregnant, so the crew created a costume which had a green screen around her belly, which was later removed during post-production. That, Justice League, is how you do clever <laughs> shit. Just saying. <laughs> Um, I didn't, next. Here's the thing, I didn't even know this fact until I read this. I'm like, oh shit, they hit that super well. And that surprised the hell out of me in reading it. And I was like, that's it. That's that's some subtle shit. That's how you do that. Um, now, some of the Amazons have flesh co- flesh colored cloth over one side of their chest, almost seeming like when breast was uncovered or non-existent. This is very apparent in the opening sequence when young Diana watches the training in the and Antiope? Antiope? I think it's Antiope. Antiope? Antiope? Damn it. I can never get these names right. Antiope <laughs> walks over uh, to talk uh, with an Amazon so clad. Uh, this may be a reference to the fact that Amazons are often depicted in art as having one breast exposed. Ancient sources even state that Amazons cut or burned off their breasts on their dominant side so that it wouldn't interfere with combat, especially with the bow. Uh, some Amazons, uh, some ancient sources suggest that this is the source of the name Amazos, yes? I was which saying, it's, in it's, Greek... It's either that or Amazos. I couldn't tell you which. It's amazing. No, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> Amazos, which in Greek means without breast. Um, and finally, this was the first female dominant superhero film in 12 years since Elektra in 2005 and it now and it's beating the now released captain marvel by almost two years so yep dc did it first and dc did it well so kudos where kudos is due 
Yeah. Real shame Electro didn't turn out as good as it could have. <laughs> yeah. But hey, Captain Marvel. Can't wait to talk about that one. That'll be great. That will be very, very fun. Totally, totally have seen it by now, but we can't talk about it. Wink. Mm-hmm. Um, let's get some initial, let's get to some initial thoughts here, Ryan. So, so before we get into the synopsis here, what did you think going into it? Man, okay. Um, so I'm gonna try not to gush too hard, but I really, really like this movie. Um, I haven't seen it since I initially saw it in 2017 and in all honesty i forgot how good it was um i think the i think the the things that it tries to do the things that it really strives for it knocks out of the park and everything else they keep it nice and clean and simple so that it doesn't stumble over trying to do something that it's not um i think the acting is amazing I think the the effects are wonderful, and I think the story that it tells, uh, both about humanity and about uh, the protagonist, are uh, like it's it's some real top notch storytelling. I can't wait to get into it, Deeper. Indeed, um, I'm gonna write down what I wrote real quick because I I want to add live a little bit, but I want to write this. I think I'm really proud of what I wrote. I'm a writer, everybody. Nice. I'm a writer. <laughs> This movie, little, this movie really tries, guys. It really does, despite its third act stumbles a little bit. Uh, it really does a good job staying above everything else in the DC FU that has been metaphorically regurgitated on the screen in front of us. Uh, not a high bar, to be sure, but this movie put that bar back where it fucking belongs this whole time. Yes. <laughs> um, with that in mind, Ryan, are you ready for a synopsis? I am very ready. We flash back to the origins of Wonder Woman. First as a child asking about plot-critical weapons and MacGuffins, uh, we also get an obligatory backstory regarding Ares and the gods because Wonder Woman's origins are ever-changing and need to be explained a little bit. Uh, we then flash forward a bit to when Steve Trevor crashes onto the island of Themyscira, trying to escape the World War I German forces. Diana saves him, from, uh, saves him only for more men, German to be exact, uh, to arrive. The Amazons arrive to help defend the island, uh, with slow motion archery and flips against the World War One guns. I guess it's just World War because World War Two hasn't happened yet. I suppose uh, okay. some die and they, uh, uh, but they win and they take Steve in for questioning. Uh, he tells them that uh, he tells them of world, the World War and of a German military leader, Ludendorff. Ludendorff has a science division led by Doctor Poison uh, to create the first real bioweapon since the smallpox blankets. Never forget Jesus uh, to turn the tide of the war. Uh, Steven, or sorry, Steve, I always say Steven for some reason. Steve has, uh, stolen the uh, stolen the notes from the compound and wants to get them to, uh, get him back home to the UK, uh, to help save some lives. Under the cover of night and with stolen relics from the Amazons, Diana frees Steve and makes a deal. I'll get you to home if you take me to Ares. Steve doesn't understand, but when a hot girl offers you a ride home, you, you just don't say no, man. You just don't say no. <laughs> Hippolyta disapproves, but doesn't really uh, fight Diana either. Instead, she just kind of disowns her a little bit. <laughs> it's fine. She'll get better. Uh, after an unrealistically short ride back to London, uh, we meet several supporting characters and Patrick Morgan. Uh, while, uh, we, uh, while he plans to send more troops to their death, Steve decides uh, he and Diana will lead a ragtag team of unprepared idiots into battle. Uh, they have they have all have interesting quirks and backstories that we aren't really going to get explored or resolved here anytime soon because stopping Ares is just too damn important. Uh, we get a cool scene where Diana steps out of the trenches and fights some Germans, basically single-handed. Uh, this results in the town being saved and some slow mo dancing. To, or sorry, not even slow mo, just slow dancing. Slow mo dancing. <laughs> just some slow dancing to celebrate. It's really more like Swain, if we're being honest here. Uh, the team sets out to infiltrate the German party uh, to find Ludendorff. Uh, neither, uh, ha uh, neither have a German accent, nor do they make any attempt to keep hidden during these events. It's lucky most of these Germans are idiots, am I right? Uh, Ludendorff yes. shows off his new super weapon by sending a bomb of their latest fart gas to the town that they just saved, killing everybody. They're dead, Jim. They're dead. Uh, Diana becomes royally pissed and Steve, uh, that Steve would not let her just kill Ludendorff on the spot. And come on, what the hell? He was right there. I, I got the sword. I could just I could just do it now. He's out looking. I could do it. Uh, but listen, you don't have, you don't understand. 
uh, we have to fill the runtime just a little bit more. Uh, Diana rushes to Ludendorff's airbase, uh, where they are prepping more fart gas bombs to drop on London. Uh, after Ludendorff gets a whiff of his own fart gas, he gets a boost in power and fights Diana. But he is, uh, but he is killed by the God Killer sword. Everything should be ending. Uh, the soldiers should, uh, are still, but the soldiers are still prepping the weapons, and the war is still happening. Steve tries to tell Diana that Ares isn't real, and that men, well, they, they do kind of suck. Uh, she is disheartened, while Steve is just more focused on getting, uh, stopping that fart gas from escaping the butthole of the German airbase. <laughs> wait, wait for that. Uh, as Diana watches on, uh, Patrick Morgan arrives to reveal that he was really Ares all along. It was really me, Patrick Morgan. Uh, he tr uh, tries to dip his toes in the film uh, of this film into some philosoph philosophical discussion about how he merely suggested the actions of Ludendorff or Dr. Poison. But men, the world of men, are truly evil, even without him. Uh, this discussion quickly falls apart into an over-the-top CGI battle. Uh, Diana fights because she believes in love and the inherent goodness of men as Stephen... Er, I wrote Stephen this time. I actually didn't mispronounce it. I wrote it wrong. Uh, as Steve... Sacrifices himself to destroy the fart gas bombs. Diana realizes uh, that uh, she is the god killer weapon all along and proceeds to do some, well, god killing. Uh, the war is over. The influence of Ares is gone, probably. Uh, and Diana looks over a memorial of fallen soldiers, seeing Steve's name. Uh, if only he could be in the sequel. Or is he? Tune in when we eventually cover Wonder Woman 84 to find out. So yeah, what do you think about that, Ryan? What do you think about that movie? <laughs> uh, I really, really like this movie. <laughs> like, like I said, despite that third act not being super great, the first two acts are almost perfect. I think, honestly, this is where we're going to disagree, because I actually like the third act. Oh, I do. Okay, okay. Well, 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 I, I, I really did like the third act. We can, we can jump on that real quick. So, so, so why does the third act work for you? So the third act works for me because, like, because because I I really bought into that philosophical the, like the philosophical debate that Aries really brings up. First of all, and a small segue, but I love um, I love the act. I love I'm calling him Remus Lupin because that's who I know him as. Fair enough. Um, Fair enough. But I love uh, Lupin's uh, portrayal, uh, like his his diplomat, like the diplomat who while like is a spouting for peace is actually doing everything that he can to subtly keep the, the wheels of war turning. I love this rendition of a very subtle Ares. Like the like like he's honestly not even there for the majority of the movie. He's just kinda easing things along. He's just helping things along and he plays a very subtle game of chess as opposed to like all of the renditions of Ares, the god of war, that we've seen in damn near everything. And we'll get to that tomorrow. <laughs> um, but uh, I love his rendition. I love uh, the, the calculating Ares that really, like, is very insidious and stokes war. But then the third act actually gives him a chance to really be, like, that guy who's just, like, casually, stupidly powerful and doesn't really have to exercise all that crazy ass power until there's someone who's really challenging. Um, so while it was jarring to go like to to kind of switch gears in the third act, um, I think it navigated that transition pretty good with that uh, with that with that conversation that they have. And then I think the battle itself is pretty boss. Um, I'll admit, having seen it the second time. Or I guess third time. I don't remember how many times I've seen it now. I know I've seen it more than once for sure, but I think it was my third time. Um, having gone back to it now, I don't hate the fight at all. I think the fight has some really good stellar moments to it, but it does to me. It, me, it feels lacking to me a little bit. I feel like really? I, I feel like it reminds me of the fight between Zod and Superman, and the fight between Doomsday and everybody else, where it is a lot of just CGI stuff being flown around on the screen and whatnot, and. Yeah. There are some genuinely good hand-to-hand -hand combat moments in, in the fight, for sure. But there's not a lot of them. And it's not until Wonder Woman really, like, lets go and, like, gets the whip out. I guess not the whip, the lasso. And she starts, like, going all rage mode near the end. That's when the fight really gets good. If it's everything up to that just feels just kind of like, oh, okay, we're drawing this out a little bit. And 
I don't know. From, from a fight perspective, I didn't really get too engaged until that last bit when it started really, like, she started really actually doing something cool. Um, but before that, though, let's get to the philosophical bit, because that's kind of where my crux is a little bit. Um, All right, okay. I have nothing against the philosophical discussion. I think that this film in particular needed to bring that to the table, and I, need, and I think it needed to bring a philosophical discussion in a big way, because... If we look back at uh, if we look back at the previous movies, Man of Steel and uh, and uh, Dawn of Justice, I'm not going to cap Suicide Squad because there's no philosophy there. Fuck that. Um, both those films try to have a philosophy. I think in the case of Man of Steel, it was kind of buried under the action a little bit, so you didn't really get a strong philosophical message in that final bout. Um, in Batman vs Superman, it was hammering the philosophical message as much as it could, but it had nothing to do with what was going on. Like it was just a mishmash of weird bullshit happening it, it didn't work and and doomsday offered nothing to that so a lot of mishmashing there here i think these characters really could have delivered a really good philosophical debate and we really could have gotten something really deep there but i think it transitions way too quickly like it's a pro so i was reading an article the other day about marvel movies this actually ties into that really well and um it, it referred to iron man one as the as the original as the originator of this problem, okay. um, basically Obadiah Stane is presented as this very charismatic, very fatherly figure who kind of has his own self interest in mind, and he kind of just wants to use Tony for his for his advancement, and mm -hmm. doesn't want to get his hands dirty or anything. But the end of the film, the third act, he does a very hard turn into psychopathic. I'm just gonna fucking murder you kind of way, right, a and. Right. The, deb the discussion was that while everything up to that moment was really good, that felt a little out of left field for his character in particular. Now, Ares is not like that. Ares obviously is a murderous monster psychopath, but this movie has built him to be a bit more, like you said, subtle, a little bit more, a little bit more hands off, and more just a suggestive figure, kind of like Loki almost, if you think about it. But then again, once he is like knows he has to fight Diana. It just kind of does that one e twist, like, oh, yeah, no, I'm gonna just f fuck it straight up murder you. And it's like, I don't know if I appreciate that sudden one eighty into f from philosophical discussions and trying to convince her to let's just fucking fight and I'll just snap your neck or some shit. You know what I mean? Okay, so so uh, my counter to that is the fact that it is twofold. Um, first, it comes up for Ares in the fact that his original goal of it was not to like kill Diana, but to convince Diana that men are worthless and to join his side. Not men as in men, but men as in mankind, yeah. as in humanity is 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 worthless and that, that things were better when, when they when they actually weren't here. So he's just going to encourage them to kill it to kill themselves and thus proving their unworthiness. Um and ever so everything before the movie the, the subtle touches that he does, including, like, actually funding them to, like, go throughout No Man's Land and, like, actually travel, like, traverse the fronts of the war, is, like, goes towards that end. He sends her to the front of the field so that she can witness the cruelty of men firsthand. And notice that he only actually makes himself known after she kills who she thinks is the big bad and the last bit of her like childhood naivete is dashed when she realizes that it isn't just one person that's fucking it up it's humanity is fucked up like it's only when like her core like beliefs are truly shaken that he makes his actual play and it's only when he realizes that she's not going to go with him that he starts being lackadaisical because he's like, at the end of the day, he is a god. He can kill her. He believes he, she's just an Amazon, like a, a very powerful Amazon that's, that's a demigod, but he doesn't believe that she can actually stand a chance and isn't trying to kill her until she starts really coming out of the bag with all the god powers. So I don't feel like it was a sudden turn. I feel like he ramped up as the situation called for it. And the fact that it that the third that the last fight really goes so over the top proves that she's actually pushing him to those limits because you see him literally toying with her at 
the beginning. F- fair enough. Fair enough. I don't know. I, I'm not a hundred percent sold on it, but I do kind of see where you're coming from on this. That's fair. That's fair. And now, now, like as a kind of a, a segue from that as well, I love like the the overall philosoph- like philosophical debate of the question, like philosophical debate of the movie. I feel is done better than any DC movie to date. And the reason is because it keeps that question front and center throughout the entire movie. It's not like, like she has, there, there, there is a plot. There are like the missions, you know, she has to like traverse to the front because she believes Ludendorff is actually Ares. And when she kills him, the war will end. And like, like the, the plot had like the storyline has plot beats that they have to do, but the focus of it is Diana encountering the world of men. Um, and she's encountering it at one of the worst times in mankind's history. And she's seeing some of the worst things that mankind are capable of, but she also gets these small moments where mankind really proves how touching they are, how caring they are, how loving they are. And it's, it's portrayed through like the most unlikable people. I mean, fucking Steve Trevor is a spy. He's a murderer. He's a liar. He's a cheat. He's all of these things. But at the end of the day, you have this guy who actually believes in the best of humanity. That's gone. That's seen the worst of it and still wishes to fight for the redeeming qualities. And it's his sacrifice that actually undoes not even undoes but really redeems mankind in diana's eyes i like that they really transition they really take that seed of a story and take diana from this naive little girl who believes it's all a story uh, a fairy tale and that there's one guy at the end and if she beats him then everything will be okay and has her actually grow up on the war front and then sees all the worst of humanity and still chooses to save us. I will say that is something that, and I don't like compare to Marvel movies much when we're doing this series, but I feel like this is something I really wish Thor had done in his first movie from being like that bratty kid to growing <sighs> up like this, like not a one-to-one, but I feel like a definitely a, 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 a thing that triggered him to grow up would have been more appreciative in that film. You don't get it until movie two, and movie two has a lot of other problems that make it difficult. So. Yeah, so. yeah, that that's that, that is fair. Uh, Thor, Thor's storyline is definitely like it has some similar beats, but you never really like you don't really see him like rise to that whole "I have a responsibility as God and King" until the Dark World. And again, Dark World had a lot of other issues that obfuscated that growth because Thor had some real kick-ass character development in that movie, but nobody noticed. If you want to hear our thoughts on the Thor movies, go check out our podcast, link down yes, below. Yes, please do. <laughs> um, so I want to go back to what you are saying about World War One, though. So World War One was chosen as the backdrop for this film. It's one of my discussion questions, but uh, I want to bring it up here. So mm-hmm. World War One, I, I think, is a perfect setting for this movie because if you had done World War II it would have been extremely obvious who the bad guys are. There wouldn't have been any question. It would have, been, it would have just been like, oh, the, the Nazis are evil. Done. Yep. Um, and World War II is a scene that, no offense to the filmmakers out there, World War II has been done to death. It's I, been done a lot. I like World War II. World War II is great, but I've seen a lot of it. I don't need to see more of it right now. World War One is, for those who don't know history, a very morally ambiguous war where you could arguably say no one in the war was actually evil. Period. Um, and I think, and I honestly think that's true. Ryan, what, what do you know about World War One, if anything? Not much. I know what was in this movie. <laughs> well, I will give you a 60-second brief synopsis on World War One, real quick. Break it down, Wonder Wisaska. Break it down. Uh, so a uh, ambassador to, I want to say it was uh, like Sweden or Norway or something, one of those countries... Uh, someone who was allied with uh, Germany, I think, was assassinated. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm sure I got the name wrong. This is Franz Ferdinand, isn't it? Yeah. Wait. It's like the, like the Prince of Austria or something like that? Yeah, I think so. Now no, you got it right. Duke, Duke, yeah! Duke, Duke, Duke of Austria. I know shit. He Sorry. was assassinated. Uh, and because of this, um, I believe it was Germany who was lined up around their borders trying to prepare themselves for whatever's going to go down. Because Austria want to start a fight with somebody else. And Austria's like, hey, you can back us up if, if we got some shit going down. Or, no, it was the Ottomans, maybe. One of them. 
Anyway, so one of the one of Germany's allies is getting involved in, in a little bit of a, of a kerfuffle, and Germany's like, well, listen, we're going to put our guys on the border if you need any help, but we're not going to get involved if we don't have to. France, being panicked because Germany had just kicked their ass, taking land back, and forming Germany, were like, oh shit, Germany's getting ready to do some shit. Let's get our guys on the border. And so they got their guys on the border. And then everyone's like, oh shit, everyone's on the border. We should probably fight before they do something. And I don't remember it, it, what... Was, I, I, I took history class. I don't remember who they said was the one that actually fired the first shot. I want to say it was France, but I might be wrong. But, um, yeah, basically all these guys got in a fight because there was miscommunication involved and no one wanted to back down. And because of that, the war just escalated from there. And then, well, here we are now. Everyone's fighting for literally no reason. Yeah. Because yeah. no one can trust one another in this era before computers and phones are really a big deal. Yeah. So, so like going back to your question, yes, I think I think uh, the First World War uh, is a wonderful backdrop for the story, um, precisely because it's so morally ambiguous. Precisely because it's not black and white. It's not the uh, cut and dry like that. Um, the 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 overall goal of the movie is to explore Diana's like diet like to take. A, a person or, or, or like an, an other figure uh, and introduce them to all the intricacies of man. And at the end of it, essentially, she passes judgment on it. Like, like is, is my mother correct? Is the world of men actually not worth saving? Let me go out and find out myself. And World War I was, was probably the perfect backdrop to really explore the full gamut of what mankind is capable of because you see the horrors with the biological weapons and war and no man's land but you also see the 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 small town who has a, who has a party and holds their loved ones close as they're able to live another day uh, you see slow dancing you see you know all all of these good things you see ice cream it's great um so you, she really got to explore like the full gamut, and that's and yeah, I think you're correct that it was actually a perfect backdrop, while also being historically like really cool. Um, I am very curious though, since we're gonna have so the sequel has already been cited for Wonder Woman 1984, which has just been shortened to uh, Wonder Woman 84, WW 84, whatever. Um, I'm very curious why they skipped over the World War II era and the Vietnam era and went straight to this. I am very curious. I'm hoping we find out per when the movie comes out, or at least beforehand, like in some like news drops, because it's a very weird jump to make. I think. Yeah, I, I'm 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 very curious as to what actually happens in 1984 because, like, we we establish at the end of this that like she like she essentially retires from from her her cape her costumed like duties after world war one and she kind of just hides herself in the world of men um and it's not until that until dawn of justice that she's really called to like actually step up and do her thing again so now, my question is what's so important in 84 now that what might happen that that whole taking a break from superheroing and until the batman vs superman movie comes out that might get retconned with the new restructuring DC's been doing. We'll we'll find maybe, out for sure. Maybe. maybe I don't know. I mean, the, I don't know. I mean, ever since Aquaman and, and now with Shazam coming up, they seem really quick to just bury those movies. Like, yeah, no, these didn't happen, guys. We're gonna we're, look at this. This is shiny and new. Watch this. Don't look at me burying this thing. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look, I'm a target. <laughs> um. Okay. Okay. So I got some more questions here, Ryan, for you. Please. Um, so going to the villains real quick, one more time. Did you find General Ludendorff and Doc, or, or Dr. Maru, Maru uh, interesting villains? Why or why not? No. Uh, <laughs> I, well, so, 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 did I think they were interesting? No. Do I think they're bad villains? No. Um, I actually don't. Um, I think that they're good on screen. I think Dr. Maru... I like doing that cold, detached scientist that doesn't really give a shit about human life, but really is interested in the discoveries and you know ending human life. I think uh, I think Elena Anaya did a fantastic job doing that. Um, I think uh, I think they were good for what they were intended, 
And when you look at the overall narrative and what we were, we just spent a whole bunch of time discussing, the real focus of the narrative isn't on these guys. Like it isn't on the general or the evil fucking poison lady. It was just it was on the 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 duality, the dual nature of man. And I think the general and the doctor really it kind of embodies some of the worst traits of men, mm-hmm. you know, the rage, the, the wrath, the, uh, the, uh, the cold detachfulness, um, that people can, can, can inhibit. Um, and if you look at them just kind of as scions of like the worst shit in humanity, I think they do that job to a T. But if you're looking for a subtlety, if you're looking for a bunch of depth that really kind of gets to the heart of the philosophical question put into the movie, you're not looking at those guys you're looking at Remus Lupin, who's been manipulating everything behind the scenes the whole time. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I would say that I, I am mostly on the same page as you. Um, I think I like Dr. Maru's design a little bit, at the very least. I, I yeah. like the little face thing. That's cool. I kind of wish we got an explanation for it, but I didn't need it. Because it's like, okay, why is your face all fucked up? Oh, you're not going to tell? Okay, whatever. It's cool. <laughs> um, as for Ludendorff, he does... Ludendorff is the Ronin, the accuser of this movie. He is literally just kind of there to play the role of a big, dumb villain and then be mm-hmm. replaced by something better at the end. Yeah. And I think that's fine. I think it's... He, he represents the obstacle for Diana to get to her actual goal, and that's fine. Yeah. I, I think... We, we A lot of fans like to complain about villains not being uh, all they can be and some of them falling very short, but I think... In the case of this, or a villain like, say, Hammerhead from Spider-Man, or uh, I'm trying to think of a Batman villain that kind of fits the mold, I guess Condiment King, maybe? There's a lot of, like, grunts and thugs and just lackeys that aren't really going to be impressive, guys. They're going to just be mm-hmm. your run-of-the-mill, like, evil dickheads. And yeah. it's perfectly fine to have them. They're not going to be your w- w- award-winning, overwhelming characters. But they're going to help the characters that you care about uh, grow and change and become better because it's an obstacle for him. So I think Ludendorff's fine. But uh, definitely nothing that like is like, oh my god, gotta make a t-shirt of Ludendorff. <laughs> yeah. Hashtag uh, Ludendorff t-shirts. <laughs> um, okay, moving on, moving on. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Um, trying to look at one of the other questions here that's really good. Okay, okay. How does, so, so uh, this feels like an obvious question, Ryan, but I want, I want specifics, I want some specifics. Uh, how does this film in particular uh, improve from the slate of DC films we've seen so far? <laughs> oh, it has substance. I mean, shit. <laughs> I mean, I, um, I, I, go, go, well, I'll start off with saying that it, 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 with the messages and whatnot, it's definitely less like in your face, hammer to the face kind of nonsense we got with all the Zack Snyder films. Which is hilarious, actually, when you think about it. Like, so I mentioned earlier that they keep the the, the philosophical question, like, forefront in the movie, and that's why it's done so well. But they managed to keep it forefront, yet subtle. Like, uh, um... Like, we focus on, like, essentially Diana encountering every aspect of humanity, but we don't hammer it in a la fucking uh, Jesus allegories to your face, like, every seven minutes. So, it, like, I feel like she, she, I feel like Patty Jenkins is really balancing a delicate plate there, and it's, it's, it's really, really good storytelling, because you're keeping it in the front, but you're also doing it very, very subtly. You still have the plot moving. You still have great uh, interactions between your characters on screen. But all the while, in the back of your mind, Diana is, a, is like, essentially judging humanity. Mm-hmm. And, uh, like, a so- like, like, like you, can, you, can do, you can do big questions and have them be, like, the forefront thing in your story without literally having fucking Clark Kent with Jesus on his shoulder... Uh, asking the priest if mankind is worth him sacrificing himself for. Clark. You can do that. Hey, hey Clark. Zach, Clark, you can do that. Hey, Clark, it's, it's me, Jesus. So uh, if you want to sacrifice yourself for man, go for it, bro. It's fine. I did it once, and it was cool. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think they're worth it. I think you might have made the wrong decision, God. <laughs> don't, don't, don't listen to him, Clark. He's the devil. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so, so going on to Patty Jenkins, actually, because I do want to ask about that. 
So she was the director of this movie, and Zack Snyder is actually one of the three people in charge of writing this movie. How much say do you think Patty Jenkins had in the final product? Because here, 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 so like, so for example, the action scenes in particular do incorporate a, a fair bit of slow mo, definitely restrained from what we normally see from Zack Snyder, but it's still mm-hmm. there. So I have a feeling he had a hand in the in the action scenes a little bit because I do yeah. definitely feel like his style. Yeah. But but beyond that, I want to. I'm very curious what what how much how hands on he was and how much say she had in the film. I think it's apparent how much say she had in the film because the film is good. I mean, <laughs> excuse me. Um, I think her her directorial and storytelling style is more apparent. Yes, like you you see Zack Snyder in the action sequences, and I think it's because Zack Snyder knows how to make shots look really good. Zack Snyder is not a bad director. He is really good at doing action and at making these amazingly beautiful shots on screen. You have to give the man credit where it's due. Mm -hmm. And having him have a hand in the fight sequences, I think it made the film better for it. Because when the film does hit the action button, it's action. It's for real. It's fucking... 20 foot long like y'all like long sword tosses that are slow-mo in the air while somebody gets like gets scraped it's amazons versus uh germans in world war one uh uh soldier attire it's really really good but when the action takes a step back and you focus on the story and you focus on like what's actually being said by the piece i think that's where you really see uh jenkins uh, touch like in the movie so i think i honestly think this is a, this is one of those ideas this is one of those moments where the 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 uh the company stepped back and said okay miss jenkins you have the floor do your thing we've got these writers for you they wrote the script um we've got zach here to do uh, to, to to show you what like how the fight scenes are gonna are gonna look but i think they let her run the show I think she took. Uh, I think she took advice when it was given, but she kept her uh, vision forefront in her mind, and I think it came out spectacularly. Mm-hmm. It's always a question I like to think about when you, when these big movies come out, because like if you go back to uh, Thor Ragnarok, you could tell Taika Waititi had like the flo- had like his hands on the wheel and could just go everywhere with it. Like he was all over the place, um, and it, it made for a fun film. And I, you, it's just fun to kind of guess and see, like, the the percentages of how much influence and how much control a director or writer or whatever had over a film versus the studio or versus, like, the Kevin Feige, Zack Snyder world or whatever. And this, mm-hmm. this, this is a fun piece to talk about with that because I think this is the first film that really deviates from everything else that's been happening so far. And in a very good, very impactful way. Yeah. One hundred percent. I definitely agree with that, and I'm hoping that the change and the success that the change has brought will really, really impact the DCEU for years to come. I think. Uh, I think the. I think the change in direction uh, was definitely apparent, and we'll talk about that later in Aquaman, guys. So stay tuned for that. Indeed. Uh, but if I borrow from my future self for a hot second, Cleostro. Cleostro. <laughs> um, I've looked into the future and I've actually seen Aquaman and I can tell you it was an amazing movie. But the I think the difference between the two of them, just real quick, is that um, Aquaman was created to be an amazing blockbuster film um it wasn't amazingly deep it had some deep moments in it it definitely had some things that it got into but overall it was just fun it was an amazing spectacle the the cgi was off the charts and it was done really really well um and it was just a blast from start to finish whereas wonder woman was a really well crafted well designed piece of cinema (laughs) And I think it says a lot. Um, And this and Aquaman, I think, are pointing in the direction that DC is actually going to be really putting out some kick-ass movies from here on out. 
Um, I, I, I will have to see if it's a if it's a hat trick with Shazam. Uh, but based on those two movies, I I think DC's got some real cool stuff coming up. Based on the trailers too, Shazam looks pretty good. Um, I, I want to go go on your with your future self here real quick. <laughs> <laughs> so I mentioned prior to the podcast uh, that um, I had a, a, a just a metaphor, so to speak, uh, in regards to these these DC movies. Um, so I want to put I want to put my film journalism hat on real quick because. One thing journalists like to do is compare the stuff they're talking about to food. So here, we're, we're going to do that real quick. So right. let's look at the entire DCEU we've seen so far. I'm going to include Aquaman in this, even though you guys haven't seen it uh, with us, like you haven't heard our podcast. Just, 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 bear, with Astro. just bear with me. So uh, to start off with, with Aquaman, actually, let's make it simple. We'll start with Aquaman. Aquaman is a multi-layered taco pizza. It has all these radical, crazy flavors but it's fun, it's exciting, it's well pre- uh, presented, it's a fun time you're going to have, but it's also not the healthiest thing for you. Um, fair, fair. Um, <laughs> to go on the other, opposite end of the spectrum, well I guess not opposite, but going further down the spectrum, you have Suicide Squad, which is literally just drive through Burger King. <laughs> it's not horrible, but it's certainly not filling and not good for you. <laughs> So would uh, would Harley Quinn be the fries in this equation? Because the fries are boss. She's a chicken fries. Actually, the chicken fries are pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, in the case of let's let's look at the Batman or Superman then. To me, that is a attempt to make a big meaty steak and just present a big meaty steak for you. Uh, there's a bunch of sides that aren't quite done all the way. And the steak itself is still bleeding quite a bit. Oof, duh. And it's like, you can definitely see what they're trying to do here, but man, they could not finish this meal to save the life of them. And it was I did not order this rare, sir. Jesus Christ. Actually, it's still actually, bleeding. Actually, I ordered it cooked. I don't think you put it in the oven at all. It's like, no, 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 we did, we did. I just think we forgot to turn it on. <laughs> uh, Man of Steel is a much smaller, much leaner steak. Uh, with a little bit of size. It's a little bit better, but it's a little, I would say, maybe overcooked a little bit. A little bit. It's yeah, not bad. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. I can see that. I would say Wonder Woman is, I wouldn't say perfect, but it definitely has a more fleshed out dinner plate for you. It's got the salad. It's got the, it's got a, a nice, well-toned brisket. It's got everything. It, it basically is everything. It might just be missing dessert or something is all it is. And I think that alone is my explanation of where I'm at with these movies. I think that is definitely how I look at these. A little I bit. like it. I like it a lot. Good analogy there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I, I try sometimes. I try sometimes. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, so that is that. What else do I have on my question list here? I think we've covered quite a bit of these without even trying, actually. Um, okay, last one I'll get to before we hit a quick round of trivia. Uh, how does this... Uh, what strength does Wonder Woman bring to cinematic superhero films... That that other DC or Marvel films have yet to do. Well, I think I think the obvious one we can get out of the way real quick is it you know gives a leading role to a female character and they do a really good job making her a character. Yes. Ooh, uh, you know what? So so I see another question here, and I want to kind of pull that in um, because I think this movie is an amazing piece of art, and I think I think it's. I think it's a wonderful feminist message without being without beating you in the face with the feminist message. Um, a perfect example is when they're at the no man's land and Diana's like, no, this is horrible. We have to save these people. And he's like, no, this is no man's land. That means no man can cross it. It's like she deliberately set the T right there like the obvious i am no man i'm gonna fucking do thing but she doesn't take it like it was set up just to be like the groan and take like the oomph out of it but she doesn't take it instead of making it all about wonder woman's fem like like femininity it's about diana as a character it's Mm -hmm. like May, like maybe like it's it's not what we as a group are here to do, but it's what I am going to do. 
and then she steps out and it's the first time that you see her in the fucking garb and she steps out and she is Wonder Woman. And she is this badass who has all the power in the world and uses it to save people who need saving. And she's female. It's not that a female does it better than all these men. It's that Diana, as a character, steps out into the fore and is an amazing person who is female. I think that is, I think that's the the message, like, or that's one of the messages. And hey, feminists, please add us, talk about it, talk about continue discussion below. I love to, I'd love to talk about it with you guys in depth. Um, but the idea that as a character, she's amazing and she's fantastic and she really has all of this strength of character and it shows that females are just as capable of bravery and heroics as men when she steps up and she does somebody that, something that nobody can do. So I think as a, fe a feminist message, I think this is perfect. I think it strikes the nail on the head specifically by not focusing on her gender. Because aside from like some of the flirting and just like the general romance of the story, like not a lot is focused on her gender. Like you have like the asshole uh, war leaders who dismiss her out of hand because she's a, a, a woman. Which I found common. Like, which I, I, I found, I, I felt like it needed that because like just to be true to the time, like if, of if a woman went up to a bunch of army generals and told them what needs to be done, they'd laugh in her face and told her to go make them a sandwich. That's real. It sucks, but it's real. And I think a dose of reality is definitely called for. But the rest of the movie, it's like all of that shit is done away with. And in the face of war, you know, it's just about who you are as a, as a person. And I think that Diana really shines through and is a beacon for both men and women that humanity can aspire to greatness. And the fact that she's a female just makes it perfect. Mm -hmm. um, I talked for a while. I'm no, sorry. no, I appreciate it. I, I like episodes where I don't have to talk as much. It means I can kind of I voice rest a little bit. Um, but no, uh, I, I agree. And I think that, uh, what was I going to say? Uh, you you kind of hit, hit it a little bit in there. Uh, this movie definitely is a little bit more of the show don't tell kind of thing. Uh, by letting the letting the characterization come through the action, the no man's land scene I think is, without a doubt, one of the best moments in in at, at the very least uh, comic book films uh, for mm -hmm. sure, because in any lesser movie, in any movie that would have just like been a little bit more of a hackneyed job in the writing department, uh, she would have said something like, "I'm not a man, I can do that," and then she would have gone right. out there and done it. But like you said, she just went out there and did it, and. I think the fact that they just let that speak through the action versus having to have more cheesy dialogue in there says a lot about the care they took into making this film. Because I lo here's the thing. I love uh, writers who like to give quippy lines like that to, uh, to, to to their characters like Whedon does. But I think sometimes they go out of the way to overwrite the characters. And, yeah. And you get a lot of dialogue that really shouldn't need to be there. So I think this film was also very restrained. And I think that is something we need more in superhero movies a little bit. I'm not saying to restrain them from any kinds of fun. I'm just saying, let's, let's, let's ro rope it in. Let's, let's, we want to make these movies worthy of Oscars, if you know what I mean. And you're only going to get there if you restrain your writing and really just put the stuff in your film that needs to be there. Um, and I think Wonder Woman is not Oscar worthy. She, she is not to that level yet. But this is definitely a film worth talking about. And I think that it's possible, it's sequel or future sequels down the road. Maybe they will take that leap. Maybe they will make that jump, but I can't say for sure. But I definitely see the potential there based on what we're seeing here now. So who knows what they could grow into, but I definitely like where this is starting and where it could be going. Me too. In, in, in all honesty, I, I think there is a, I think there's an, I, there, there's a prevailing idea in like a lot of like big budget movies to make uh, your move to make your product pal palatable for everybody so that I can make the most money, and I think a lot of that has kind of distilled into this idea that audiences are dumb and need to be kind of spoon fed everything. Um, 
I think that, especially in a lot of mainstream, like, movies and media, uh, subtlety is kind of, like, starting to become a lost art, which is really sad. Um, but I think Wonder Woman is really a love letter to the fact that, like, you can tell big stories and you can tell, like, these, you can really give these kind of, these tried and true heroic journeys without punching you in the face with it you know you can tell mm -hmm. aspects of these very subtly and in doing so it's presented in a much better way exactly like you said it show don't tell um because something that an audience can grasp after watching it or like really sitting and like ruminating on it for a little while like that, th that's something that they'll take to heart, you know, like how many people have seen this movie a couple of times and like really like the, the idea that there was no big bad at the end, that part of humanity is just ultimately fucked up. And yet there is still goodness in us. How many, like how many people did that resonate with? specifically because it wasn't shoved in your face. It was just like, it was really laid out for you for the majority of the movie and then like stated kind of as a thesis when Diana is essentially ready to write off humanity like all in one and you have the liar, the spy, the murderer, the thief espouting for the goodness of humanity and saying how he wishes he could tell her it was that simple but it's not, and that he tries and sacrifices anyway, despite all of that. Like, the subtlety of that whole story, that's what resonates with people, as opposed to just saying, yeah, no, people are bad, but we're also good. Help. You know what I mean? This is the, this is the one movie of the, of the DCEU I would recommend watch uh, Trader Joe's. One hundred percent. Oh, everybody should see this movie. Little boys and girls alike should all see this movie. Yep, yep. Um, and I'm not saying that to be like overly like you know. Oh, it's 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 all you know. Ladies first, you should check it out. No, no, everyone should see it. And it's not because it's the best film in the world. It's not going to light the world on fire in any like way beyond what we were discussing here. But it has very idyllic, uh, very wholesome messages. Uh, I, and themes that will resonate with kids and make them better people growing up, I think. Or at the very least, help give them some kind of uh, groundwork to work from. I would not show them any other DC movies because I don't think they grant any kind of... They don't grant that kind of levity. They don't grant that kind of uh, of that theming. This is literally just, hey, you know, uh, we, should, we, we, we need to treat each other better. We, we need to be more compassionate. We need to be better people. And this movie here shows you that even though humanity is bad, we all have potential to be very good. And I think that is definitely something that kids, everyone, should take away from this. Not just kids, everybody. But show, show it to kids because it'll help them grow and, and be more certain of who they are as they're growing up, I think. Yeah. Well put, sir. Before we move on, Ryan, uh, do we have any other things we want to discuss on the uh, Man, film discussion I could, here? I could talk about this for another hour, in all honesty. I, I know we gotta <laughs> move. I know we gotta move. I just, I just, I, I really know, I like know. it. I really, really like it. <laughs> it it's, it's good we can have, it's been a long 2019 with movies that are kind of waffling all over the place, but this is definitely the high bar, I think, or at least one of the high bars in quite a while. Um... And if you want to discuss these philosophical these philosophical discussions, or if you want to ask us questions, or if you want to even just say, hey, I think Wonder Woman is pretty good, but when are we going to get a Martian Manhunter movie? I'm with you. Go to Twitter, Tumblr, Facebook, or to our lovely email. Ryan that is email. none of us deserve Diana Prince at Gmail. I mean, <clears throat> sorry, messed up again. That is evacstation at gmail.com. Indeed. I, I want to make some outlandish promise like, hey, for every email I get saying that Martian Manhunter should get a movie, I'll donate a dollar to charity. But I feel like if I make that promise, I'll end up donating a lot of money to charity I don't have. Yeah, but <laughs> then we'll have a lot of people watching the channel. We might have a people watching the <laughs> channel, maybe. I won't promise that yet, but when I have... So I, I have news for you, Ryan, that might turn into something, but I'll tell you later. It's It's... 
potentially money oh, job related. Snap. So just, just just you hold up there. Um, so that if that pans out, maybe maybe I'll do a charity thing. We'll see. Um, <laughs> let's see what else we got here. Um, oh yeah, and uh, make sure you go to patreoncom evexation because while uh, I can't currently get the charity at the moment because I'm poor, uh, you can go to our Patreon and give us money because we're poor, and you can help us make our show better and less poor. Again, we're poor. Alex, we're poor. Um, Ryan, should I jump to the trivia now, or should I hold it for the animated discussion? Um, you might as well actually hold it for the animated. I know we're running a little long, and the animated won't Only be super-duper yeah. long, long-winded. Okay. Okay. Um, so I guess we'll uh, wrap up here for those who were just joining us who waited this long uh, to get into the DC films. Let me give you a heads up. So what we do is we're currently doing a uh, Who Wore It Better segment in our second episode because we're doing two episodes a week. So if you want to see Who Wore It Better, the live action or the animated version, tune in tomorrow where we discuss the 2009 animated feature also titled Wonder Woman. Mm. It's, it's interesting. I, I think it's going to be fun to discuss it a little bit. Yes, we will. We will definitely. We will definitely have have, have some fun with that one. Um, and then for those who are curious, next week we'll be doing Justice League and Justice League War as the companion piece. After that, after that, you'll get Aquaman followed by Cap uh, followed by Shazam, and then we're in Marvel month with Captain Marvel, Ant Man, and Endgame. Yes, it's my birthday month, guys. Don't miss it. So I'm excited. I'm excited to see that. Um, and I'm trying to think if there's anything else we need to discuss before we head out. Um, no, yeah, we already gave all the comments, all, all the suggestions. So yeah, uh, we'll see you tomorrow for Wonder Woman and we'll see you after the credits. Bye.